Welcome to the Soka Women Lecture 2022 titled Collaborating to Solve the Climate Crisis. I'm Yayi, and I will be your host for this afternoon. I feel privileged to be part of this discussion as sustainability and climate change are topics close to my heart, having worked in this space professionally in the last 10 years. The Soka Gakai Singapore, formerly known as Singapore Soka Association, Women and Young Women Divisions have embarked on a biannual public lecture series since 2019 as a form of community outreach through a discussion of relevant topics related to our climate, current societal climate. Today, in cooperation with the National University of Singapore's Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions, we have put together this little lecture collaborating to solve the climate crisis. We are also happy to share that this lecture is supported by Clean and Green Singapore. Respect for all life is a fundamental value of Buddhist philosophy, as we believe all lives are interdependent. As such, we value the importance of harmonious coexistence between humans and nature, among human beings, and within one's self. This is closely linked with the concept of sustainable development. Ecological protection, social safeguards, and economic prosperity go hand in hand. We cannot hope to prosper as a society while degrading the environment, as this ultimately impacts humanity's ability to access life, life's essentials, such as food and clean water. Today's lecture will delve into how we as individuals can create the causes to transform our relationship with the environment and help alleviate the effects of climate change. To kickstart this afternoon's session, may I invite our SGS Young Women Division Chief, Ms. Lee Lian, to deliver the opening address. Ms. Lee, please. Thank you very much, Yai Yi. Once again, to Prof Ko, General Director Tay, Young, Young Division, Young Women Division Chief and all Soka Women and Friends, a very good afternoon. Thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon for this first Soka Women Lecture of 2022. I'm sure all of us, we are so excited and looking forward to hear from Prof Ko later on his sharings and insights on the theme, Collaborating to Solve the Climate Crisis. In his 40th Animal Peace Proposal this year, as Joint President Ikeda focuses particularly on the topics of youth, women, and the future of our children. On the issue of climate change, which he has persistently spoken on the past 40 years, he has cited examples of solutions to social issues that concurrently empower women while addressing climate change through reforestation. Underlying this is the fundamental Buddhist principle of dependent origination and the oneness of man and environment. As Nichiren Daishonin, the founder of Nichiren Buddhism, wrote, I quote, Environment is like the shadow, and life the body. Without the body, no shadow can exist, and without life, no environment. In the same way, life is shaped by its environment, unquote. The power of one individual to create a positive chain of reaction across this net of connections is key. In the same spirit, President Ikeda further emphasizes in his proposal that this interconnectedness comes in the form of global commons, Earth's shared natural resources such as climate and biodiversity. He advocates a focus on safeguarding this common heritage of humankind. As with complex problems like the pandemic, the ongoing crisis and climate change, President Ikeda identifies that there's no one size fits all solution. Instead, he references First President Maki Gucci's discussion on great good members of society like you and I can perform. He cites Maki Gucci's concern con and conviction that value is not found in things, but in relations. It is not the size or scale of our actions, but how we have impacted the person right in front of us that with the conviction that we have set off a chain reaction of empowerment. What can ordinary folks like me and you do in this space of a seemingly larger than life issue like climate change. The example of Hazel Henderson, who is an ordinary housewife turned into a futurist and economist comes to mind. Henderson never received any formal education at university, but 
Driven by a mother's compassion for her daughter to breathe clean air, she formed the Citizens for Clean Air group with 10 other like-minded mothers and started by just talking to each other. And this group successfully campaigned for the first ever New York Air Pollution Index to be reported on radios, newspapers and television, giving visibility to air quality in the city and kick-starting Henderson's foray into sustainable development. Compassion was her driving force and what helped her bring together a community of organized good. Henderson actually went on to become a self-taught economist, contributing to radical rethinking of economic theory that includes the unseen care economy as well as the value of mother nature. From humble beginnings, today, Henderson has advised 30 governments on economic policies and her column has been published in 400 newspapers across 27 countries worldwide and she is an expert in ethical investing. And in light of the change she has achieved, Henderson says that she has simply studied in the University of Human Life and learned that all people have the capacity to do good. In the seminal treatise on establishing the correct teaching for the peace of the land that notably takes the form in, of a dialogue between a host and a guest, Nichiren Daishonin wrote, I quote, you have associated with a friend in the orchid room and have become as straight as monkwood growing among hemp. A friend in the orchid room indicates a person of virtue. The company of a virtuous person works as a good influence, just as one is imbued with fragrance on entering a room filled with orchids. It is said that mock wood, supported by hemp, plants grow upright. And perhaps among us here, the green fingers among us can testify to this. And each of and every one of us joining today's lecture, it's as if we have walked into a beautiful nursery of orchids, entering a greenhouse filled with the fragrance of sweet-smelling orchids. So who is this friend in the orchid room? We don't have to look too far. It's none other than each and every one of us, you and me, which and Hazel, the example of Hazel Henderson, which we have learned about. In the same way, the friendships of this orchid room that are born from dialogues are a powerful force for creating peace and security in our communities and the world at large. To conclude, borrowing the words from Sir Isaac Newton, I quote, if I have seen further than others, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants, unquote. So let's really enjoy this lecture this afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Young Women Division Chief, Ms. Tay. Before we commence the lecture, we have invited our very own SGS Young Women Division member, Ms. Claire Chong, to perform a favorite piano piece of hers, titled Homage A Edith Piaf by Francis Polanc. Claire is a commercial and narrative filmmaker currently signed to directors Think Tank. She also runs her own production house called Hey Studio. At the age of six, she learned piano from her mom. In one of her trips to Japan, she visited the Sokagaka International Min On Art Museum and fell in love with this beautiful piece of music that she would like to share with us today. Let us all welcome Claire, please. Hi, my name is Claire, and today I'll be playing Homage to Edith Piaf by Francis Poling.
Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful performance, Claire. Today, we are most delighted to have with us Professor Ko Lian Pin. He is the Professor of Conservation Science Technology and Policy and Director of the Tropical Marine Science Institute at the National University of Singapore. Also, the Director of the NUS Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions, a research center that seeks to inform climate policies, strategies, and actions in Singapore and in the Asia Pacific region. Professor Cole has 16 years of international research experience in the field of sustainability and environmental science. He has worked in institutions across Switzerland, Australia, and the United States. He returned to Singapore in 2020 under the National Research Foundation's Returning Singaporean Scientists Scheme to join the Department of Biological Sciences at NUS. Prof. Ko is also one of the most highly cited conservation scientists in Asia. A TED Global Speaker, founding director of the conservationdrones.org and the World Economic Forum Young Global Leader. I believe all of us are, are now very eager to hear from our speaker. So without further ado, let us welcome our speaker, Professor Ko Lian Pin, to share with us on the topic of collaborating to solve the climate crisis. Professor Ko, please. Hi, uh, very good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me and uh, see my. Yes, we can. We are waiting for the screen. Hi, so, sorry, everyone. Uh, my Zoom just crashed earlier. I think I should be back. Can you hear me and see my slide? Yes, we can. Ah, okay, okay, good, good. So sorry for the uh, slight technical problem. Um, very happy to be here this afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a, it's a great pleasure and great honor for me to be here today. Um, I have a, a short presentation uh, to, to share with everyone. Uh, by the way, it's, uh, uh, there's a lot of people attending this presentation, so I'm so happy. Uh, I've given many talks, but uh, we never get so many people. It's almost 1,000 people. So uh, I, I'm a little bit nervous, um, but, but uh, let, let's, let's try, try to, to, to do this. So today, my topic uh, will be about how we can collaborate to solve the climate crisis. Um, uh, as we know, um, the, we, in, in, we are facing a very serious climate crisis uh, in Singapore, but also in internationally for the whole world. And um, the key word of my talk is actually uh, collaboration. So how can we collaborate? And when I say collaboration, I'm actually talking about collaboration between nature and people. I think this uh, aligns very well with the Buddhist philosophy of um, how we need to respect all life uh, uh, in, in, in nature and also all life on this planet. So, so, um, so this, this, I, I hope this talk will be very relevant to, uh, to everybody. And, and also I hope to learn uh, from, uh, from all of you here today as well. Okay, so uh, the first thing I want to talk about is climate change. I, I think everyone here understands what climate change is, uh, but maybe just to remind ourselves, uh, climate change is not the same as, uh, as, as weather or changes in weather, because when we talk about climate change, it is actually a, a long-term uh, shift or changing of uh, average weather conditions over many, many years. So it's different from how the weather is very hot today versus the weather may be very cool tomorrow. So it's, 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 it's much longer term than that. So that is climate change. For example, um, climate change in terms of how we are experiencing uh, more rainy days uh, these few years compared to 10 years ago. So that is the kind of uh, climate change we are talking about. 
Um, so, so this is the, the definition of climate change, a long-term shift in average weather conditions. Uh, the change usually occurs naturally, but sometimes human activities can cause the change to happen more quickly than normal. Um, and, and so that is what we are uh, most concerned about, what we are most worried about. Uh, this is a, a, a slide that shows us how quickly the climate has been changing over the last 170 years. So scientists around the world uh, have actually been recording um, uh, different, different aspects of, of our climate over the past 170 years. You know, how, uh, how frequently are there uh, big storms? Uh, how, what was the temperature like uh, uh, over the course of the year? Uh, and, and tracking that change over 170 years. And if you look at this slide carefully, you can see that it is, the, it is a slide that shows temperature change for all the countries in Southeast Asia, uh, Brunei, Cambodia, Indonesia, including Singapore. So what this uh, slide here is telling us is that uh, climate change is, is very real. You know, the temperature has been increasing very rapidly from blue to red over the last 170 years. Uh, it's, it's very consistent. And this is happening across all countries in Southeast Asia. So as a region of Southeast Asia, we also have been experiencing climate change uh, uh, over the past 170 years. Then the top bar on, the, on, the, on this slide uh, shows us the pattern of climate change uh, for the whole world globally. And as you can see on that top bar, um, the pattern is, is also very similar to uh, the individual countries in Southeast Asia. So what this slide is, is telling us that is, is that climate change is happening at the country level, at the regional level, and also at the global level. So what, why, why are we experiencing uh, uh, climate change uh, so what are the causes of climate change? Um, it's essentially it's quite straightforward. The reason for climate change is quite uh, straightforward. It's quite easy to understand. So basically, climate change is caused by uh, the accumulation of carbon dioxide, CO2, and other similar types of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. And when we uh, release a lot of these CO2 and other greenhouse gases into our atmosphere, the gases act like a blanket that covers the, the, the earth, that covers the planet. So it keeps the planet very warm. It, it stops the heat from, uh, uh, from, from getting out into space. So imagine wrapping the earth in a, in a blanket. So that, that's why we are getting global warming. That's why the earth is becoming hotter and hotter. And this is called a greenhouse gas effect. So when you hear about greenhouse gas effect, you can imagine uh, we are wrapping the earth in a, in a blanket of carbon dioxide. So that, that, is, that is actually the, the main cause of climate change. Um, and humans ourselves uh, in Singapore and in many other countries around the world uh, have actually been um, contributing to climate change. So we are, um, have been uh, releasing a lot of carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases into our atmosphere over the past 170 years. Uh, how have we been doing that? Uh, when, when we produce goods, you know, we, when we build factories um, and, and we, we produce, uh, we produce uh, different types of goods, um, we release, uh, we, we need to, we need to uh, burn fossil fuels or burn oil and gas to provide the energy for us to run our factories. And when we burn fossil fuels, we release carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases to generate the power. So that releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, adding to this blanket. And also other causes, uh, other activities that are contributing to climate change include transportation. So when we drive our cars, uh, when too many people drive our cars too often, or when too many people uh, fly in, 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 in airplanes around the world too often, uh, those uh, vehicles or aircraft also release uh, carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. So again, that uh, adds to the layer of blanket around the earth. Uh, and another activity that also contributes to climate change is uh, deforestation. When we cut down our forests, our natural forests, um, the, the trees will you know, obviously will fall to the, 
to the ground. And uh, many, many times they will then decompose. And when they decompose, they also release carbon dioxide. So again, that contributes to the layer of uh, blanket, the carbon dioxide blanket around the earth. So all of these human activities over the past 170 years have been contributing to uh, global warming or climate change. Now, so what are the impacts of climate change? The impacts of climate change have been felt uh, throughout the world, including in Singapore. Uh, as I had mentioned earlier, uh, we have been uh, feeling uh, 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 hotter these days, right? So we, we like, for, for example, today, it's a very hot day, uh, and, and, and we are experiencing a, a higher frequency of very hot days uh, more recent, in more recent years than when we were maybe, maybe a bit younger, uh, 10 or 20 years ago, uh, the, the weather was, uh, there were not so many very hot days. Uh, other impacts of climate change uh, also include uh, flooding. So we also experience uh, very heavy rain, uh, days with very heavy rainfalls, and that causes flash floods. Uh, and we also experience that more often now in Singapore, even with the very big canals and, and drainage systems that we have been building, uh, we, we are beginning to experience a uh, higher frequency of flooding. Um, and, and then, of course, we also have uh, more extreme weather events. So, so these are some of the impacts of climate change that uh, many people around the world, not just in Singapore, have been, have been uh, starting to, to experience. Now, um, Southeast, for example, Southeast Asia, uh, Southeast Asia is one of the planet's most vulnerable regions to climate change. Uh, a lot of the other countries in Southeast Asia have been experiencing uh, not just the heat waves, not just the more frequent and intense rainfall, but also droughts, the very serious droughts, because droughts will affect uh, the crops, right? the, the farmers and how they can grow crops if effectively or efficiently affects the productivity. And so that will also have an indirect impact on Singapore because then uh, uh, that will uh, uh, affect our, our import of food from our neighboring countries. So this, this, the impacts of climate change has also been felt at the regional level across Southeast Asia. And of course, beyond Southeast Asia, there are also a lot of other impacts of climate change uh, at the global level. So, um, so, so climate change is affecting everybody, Singapore, Southeast Asia, and, and, and the whole planet. Now, the important thing really I want to share that I want to share today is to talk uh, about how nature can help us fight climate change. Now, given that climate change uh, is, is, is already here, we have been experiencing climate change, there is an urgent need for us to work together uh, to find solutions to tackle and adapt to climate change. And for example, we need to rapidly reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. And one very important yet very simple way to do this is to, to work with nature. Right? Instead of fighting with nature, we can work with nature. What are these so-called uh, nature-based climate solutions? How can we work with nature? Now, nature-based climate solutions uh, harness the power of nature to reduce greenhouse gas emissions or carbon dioxide emissions, and that will help us adapt to the impacts of climate change. There are uh, basically three types of uh, nature-based climate solutions. And these are the three types. Uh, the first is uh, protection. So one important type of nature-based climate solutions is to protect our existing, our standing forests uh, that we have, uh, not just in Singapore, but also across Southeast Asia, in Malaysia and Indonesia. If we can protect these forests, then we will um, reduce the emissions that will happen uh, when the forest, when the trees fall to the ground and, and their vegetation and material decompose. Another important type of nature-based solutions is restoration. And this is when, um, for example, when we had already destroyed some parts of, uh, of the forest or nature uh, or, you know, in, in the past because of uh, agriculture, for example, um, now we have a chance to restore those, uh, those lands um, by, by planting new trees and by growing new forests. And the third type of nature-based solutions is to improve how we grow our crops, for example. Um, we, can, um, we can improve our management practices 
so that uh, we reduce the carbon footprint of our farmlands in this region, in this part of the world. And, and also in, in Singapore as well, uh, because as we know, we are now uh, uh, encouraging a lot of uh, our, our younger people and our businesses to start to grow our own crops too uh, in, in, uh, in, a, in a high tech farming systems. So there is also opportunity for us to be more energy efficient in our high tech farms uh, in Singapore so that we can reduce or minimize carbon emissions. So these are these three uh, types are considered uh, the different types of nature based climate solutions. Now, in nature, uh, this is another important point. There are actually different types of uh, important ecosystems that contain a lot of carbon in them. And this, is, uh, this can be understood as the carbon rainbow. Now, for example, when we go to McRitchie Forest, uh, we enjoy the, the, the rainforest, right? the green, the trees. Uh, that is considered green carbon. It's a type of nature-based uh, uh, solution. By protecting McRitchie forest, we are protecting our forest and protecting the carbon that the, the forest contains. So we call that green carbon. Uh, when we go to Sungai Bolo, for example, uh, there is another type of uh, high carbon uh, ecosystem, and these are the mangrove forests. Uh, because they are partly in the water, uh, we call them blue carbon. Uh, so, so, so in Singapore, we actually have both green carbon and blue carbon. Blue carbon are the mangrove forests. Uh, in Singapore, we also have uh, another type of uh, color in the carbon color in the carbon rainbow, and these are the teal carbon. So the teal carbon is uh, the teal color is is a strange color that is in between green and blue, um, and this this is represented by. Uh, freshwater swamp forest. And in Singapore, we have the Nisun swamp forest. And not many uh, of us have the opportunity to go to Nisun swamp forest, but if we do, uh, I think uh, we should take the opportunity to, um, to visit. Um, and Nisun swamp forest is, is also a very important type of high carbon ecosystem because uh, it's, it's because of the, the water uh, locked in the forest. It's a swamp forest, so it's very wet. Uh, there's actually a lot of carbon that is trapped in the, in the swamp forest. So it, it becomes a very important store or storage of carbon as well. So we have green carbon, blue carbon, teal carbon, and then we also have gold carbon. Now gold carbon are the seaweeds, or uh, the scientific name is, is macroalgae. Uh, the seaweeds that we eat uh, in, in our, many of our dishes, right? Uh, and many of us enjoy seaweeds. But actually, seaweeds are also very important uh, way to uh, help to, to, to capture or to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere because they grow very quickly. Uh, and when they grow, they incorporate and absorb carbon dioxide from the air, from the atmosphere. So gold carbon or seaweeds also is an important part of the carbon rainbow. Now, um, it's important to understand also how these different types of uh, high carbon ecosystems are interconnected and interdependent uh, to one another um, because everything is interconnected in, in nature. So for example, how the, uh, the forest in Mengrichi uh, may be important to the, the mangrove forest in Sungai Bolo and as well as to the Nisun Swan Forest uh, that, that we have in Singapore. So all of these different systems are very important because there's a lot of uh, wildlife, there's a lot of energy, uh, a lot of material that are being exchanged between these different uh, ecosystems. Now, green carbon, as I've mentioned uh, earlier, uh, these are the, the forests, for example, that you see in Mangrichi Forest. Uh, and also in Bukit Timah forests are important to us because they act as a carbon storage. They are, they are like a carbon bank. They keep the, they help us lock the carbon up uh, in, in, their, in their vegetation, in their trunks, in their branches and their leaves, and also their roots underground. And of course, they are also very important uh, homes or, or habitats for uh, the many different types of species or wildlife that, that we have in Singapore. Um, for example, you know, the, the Raffles uh, banded langua, the Kalugo, uh, the hornbill that is now everywhere uh, in Singapore. Um, and these terrestrial forests also help us uh, 
uh, reduce the amount of uh, urban heat that we see in, in Singapore. So I'll move a little bit faster through these this slides uh, and, and because you are very familiar with the forest that you can see in the Aging Forest. So we have also a lot of this type of forest in the region as well. Uh, for example, in the region in the forest in Malaysia and in Indonesia, you have uh, fruit bats, you have durian flowers, and these are very important uh, uh, systems to maintain the health and the condition of the forest as well. And these forests also help us clean our water. They filter, they act as a filter for, for rainwater so that when the water flows to our reservoir, uh, the water is purified for us to drink. And blue carbon, as I mentioned before, um, they also sequester or they remove carbon very quickly. Uh, for example, uh, the, the mangrove forest in, in Sungai Mpolo uh, that many of us have visited. And uh, they also have uh, many wildlife species that live in the mangrove forest. So they're also very important to protect uh, our wildlife. And the mangrove forest can also help to reduce uh, flooding events. Now, if there are very heavy, way, uh, very high waves or very uh, stormy weathers, the mangroves can help to reduce uh, those impacts of, of the waves. And they are also very important to help us filter our water quality. Another type of blue carbon are the seagrass, seagrass meadows. Uh, some of us have been to Chek Jawa and Pulau Ubin and you would have seen uh, these seagrass meadows. So the point here is we are all interconnected, interdependent, and then this uh, blue, green, uh, teal and gold carbon are very important because they provide a lot of important services to human beings. So they are very beneficial for human society. So the last part, I'll just quickly go through to say something about what we can do as individuals to address climate change. Now, as we know, climate change is a global emergency. Uh, the Singapore Green Plan is, uh, is already uh, you know, putting the focus on how, as a nation, we need to uh, act together to ensure Singapore's sustainable de development. Um, in, in, in NUS, we are doing a lot of science and, and outreach and education uh, to, to teach people, to tell people what they can do to, uh, to, to in, do their part to help us address climate change impacts. So for example, uh, for you and for me uh, as individuals, the biggest impact that we can, can have are, are, the three, are the three things you see here. So we should try to take public transport as much as possible. We should try to eat local produce, local vegetables, uh, local fruits. Maybe don't have local fruits, but local vegetables. And, and also, of course, we need to be very careful about what we consume. Uh, don't buy what we don't need and buy only what we really need. So I think um, this is uh, the end of my talk. Uh, I hope you have learned something useful and uh, very happy to answer your questions and to continue our discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Cole, for your enlightening lecture on nature-based solutions and what we can do um, as individuals to also help mitigate the, the impacts, the effects of, of climate change. So I believe that all of us here today have learned something new from you this afternoon, and your sharing has definitely sparked some thoughts, some questions in our audience today. Um, I'm sure many of us are teaming with those questions for Prof. Ko. Uh, you may continue to post and vote for questions on our pigeon hole with the code SWL2022 at pigeonhole.at. The link can be found in our Zoom chat. Alternatively, you may also post your questions in the Zoom chat. While we give some time for our questions to stream in, Shall we take a minute to watch this video by the National Environment Agency called Let's Game Change Climate Change? Climate change is changing Singapore. And we're responding, pushing every boundary. We're greening our energy, our transport, our towns. Not enough water, we cycle it. Too much, drain and hold. And that's been our way with every challenge. To dream bigger than a small nation should. To create our own legacy. Let's be the game changer in climate change together.
Okay, thank you to the audience members who posted and voted for the questions just now. We have received a number of questions. Um, so maybe let me just uh, go through them one by one first. Uh, and they're all addressed to Prof. Cole, of course. So Prof. Cole, um, the first one that we have, right, is that um, someone from the audience asked, um, you know, she understands, you know, that recyclables, you know, need to be cleaned before depositing them into the blue recycle bins, recycling bins. Um, but, and yet, you know, we also need to save water for the end to help protect the environment. So there seems to be something contradictory here, you know, for this, this audience member is, is asking. So how should we go about doing this? And also uh, a question in relation to this topic is, um, can you also advise us, you know, how do we go about disposing our waste without the use of plastic bags? Um, throwing waste or food bones directly into the rubbish, rubbish chute, right? Without wrapping in plastic bags, does attract pests like you know rats and cockroaches. So I'm sure this person who asked this question has really given it you know a lot of thought. You know like weighing the options. You know like how to decrease the number of plastic bags to be used and how to decrease the amount of water consumed at the same time contributing to this agenda of um, recycling and um, upcycling to a certain extent. So, Prof. Ko, maybe you can share with us some of your thoughts here. Yeah, uh, th thanks for those questions. Uh, those are very important questions and very practical questions that, that I also face in my, in my, in my family. Uh, it was very interesting when the, there was uh, some discussions in Singapore about the issue of plastic bags. Right? Uh, people were, some people were not so happy. Some people were happy that supermarkets are charging you know, for plastic bags. So, so I think um, uh, it's, it's not an easy issue because uh, even this issue of plastic bag, there's some contradiction, right? Because we want to uh, we want to reduce the use of plastic bags, but then if we don't have plastic bags, how do we throw our rubbish? Right? Most of us, including myself, live in in apartments, uh, and then the, the, how you throw your rubbish is, is you, have, you have that chute, and then you just throw things into the chute, right? Um, so what we do, uh, and, and this may be also relevant to many of us here today, is to uh, is to try to use as much as possible uh, uh, recycled plastic bags uh, if we need to use uh, plastic bags. Um, and then for some of the food waste that 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 we need to throw away, uh, we can also wrap them up in newspapers or recycled paper. Uh, newspaper is the best uh, because many of us have you know, straight times, uh, they are about things like that. So we always keep our newspaper and then we just wrap. wrap, wrap uh, when you cut your vegetables, when you cook, right, the, the waste ones you throw and wrap them up in newspaper and then you throw in the, the sugar. So then you, you don't need to, then you save one plastic bag. Um, and, and sometimes we also get um, paper bags. So paper bags are slightly better than plastic bags uh, because uh, they are more uh, compostable or they, they can decompose easier than plastic bags. Uh, so, so I think paper bags also can be used uh, to, to keep our rubbish before we throw it down the chute. Uh. Um, so those are a few suggestions. Uh, of course, uh, there may be many other ways to reduce our use of plastic bags uh, uh, that I'm sure many of us here also have uh, ideas uh, on. Um, then the, the first question about the recycled bottle and, and water. Uh, so I, I hope I understand the question, uh, but I, 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 if I understand it correctly, uh, it's a question about how when we recycle bottles, uh, you know, throw it in the recycle bin, and then when the bottles are brought to the recycling facility, they, they also need to use a lot of water to wash it. Uh, so so then, then that is... a uh, that's hardly, that's hardly the, the question, but also at the same time, like before we throw it into the recycling bin, right, we are encouraged to make sure that the bottles we are uh, discarding are clean. Clean, yeah, yeah correct. So, correct. Yeah, then we have to use water. Correct. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so we have to wash it either at home or mm -hmm. somewhere when mm -hmm. at the facility where the recycling is, mm -hmm. happen, is mm -hmm. happening. So, so I think that's that's an, another conflict. Uh, there's a there's a prop, there's a uh, I think we just have to be smart. Now. So, for example, uh, I remember when I was young, my, my parents uh, used to be very uh, careful with water, right? Because Singapore is always uh, very careful about the use of water. So, so we, we used to have a, a bucket of, 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 of wastewater 
uh, that, that can be recycled even in the house or in the family that you can use to wash uh, your things that, that you don't need very clean water for. Uh, so, so maybe those, those uh, that can be a solution. So you have a bucket of water that is not so clean, but clean enough for you to wash your, your bottles before you throw them into the recycle bin. Also, the water can be used to water your plants. So, so that, that has uh, many, many uses. Uh, so, so I hope, I hope that, that, that answers the question. Uh, again, there could be other solutions or other ideas. Uh, this is just uh, my idea. Yes, um, definitely. Uh, thanks for that powerful insight. Some of the, uh, um, the women who are also in women's division members who are in, in this lecture today also shared the same thoughts as you, saying that they actually, you know, the water that they use to wash the vegetables and all, they just save it aside, put it aside and use, reuse that again. Yeah, same thing, you know, like when they buy bread, the wrappings for the bread, the plastic bags, they set it aside and then use that, you know, as, as a rubbish bag also. Yeah, so, yeah, so it's about um repurposing some of the things that we buy and to buy us to buy things that has as little packaging as possible yeah and then um so uh all right to the second question right um we are still in the midst of the pandemic um although hopefully we are turning the corner and we are you know in reaching the endemic phase soon um but um one of the common questions that have been asked by the youth uh in in the in in in, in this audience right is that they're wondering, you know, how has COVID-19 how has, how has COVID affected the climate change agenda? And in your view, right, do you think that it has set this um, agenda of, you know, resolving the climate crisis back by several years? Um, yeah, th thanks for that. Another very good question. Um, I, I think COVID has, uh, has had a very interesting impact on how the global community has been uh, acting to address climate change. Uh, when COVID first started and you know, uh, people were, most people were in quarantine and uh, there was no traffic on the, on the roads, nobody was taking aeroplane. Uh, and, 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 and we started to see uh, animals coming to the cities, right? So, so some people were very happy saying that, ah, yeah, maybe COVID will result in lower emissions. Maybe COVID will encourage the wildlife, the biodiversity to come back. Uh, um, but, but, but in the end, we, we realized, or, or now we realize uh, those, those benefits, uh, those positive effects of COVID may be very temporary. You know, because as soon as COVID uh, is getting better, in many parts of the world, uh, we start to see, of course, everybody started to go back to the business as usual. As people started, if you go out today to the shopping mall, you see, wow, oh, it's like, there's no COVID. It's so crowded. Uh, so, so I was just in Tiongbaru this morning for breakfast. Wow, oh, it's so crowded. So, so it's like back to usual. So, so the emissions start to come back, uh, people start to drive, people start to fly around. And then I mean, in the next few months, I'm sure it will become even uh, become more normal. So, so I think those positive effects of COVID uh, are, are temporary. Um, uh, so we cannot depend on, on that to address our climate change impacts. So one, one very different uh, effect of COVID that may be permanent, uh, that may be less temporary, is that it, it, I think people are beginning to realize that we may not, we may be able to uh, adopt a very different way of working. Uh, uh, and, and the most, uh, uh, the, the best example is what we are doing now, right? So if, if not for COVID, I think we will all be in a big uh, a lecture hall, auditorium somewhere, right? Everybody will have to drive there. Uh, but now I think nowadays uh, people are very used to uh, listening to talks or attending um, different events online through Zoom or Teams or some, some of these virtual uh, conferencing uh, platforms. So, so I think um, um, maybe that, that part uh, may be become uh, more acceptable and more permanent. So, so that may have uh, some, some impact to reduce uh, uh, commute to work. Uh, um, and so in that sense, uh, that may be a positive thing for, for, for addressing climate change. Um, there are also other 
bigger impacts uh, that COVID had on climate change uh, besides uh, our contribution to carbon dioxide, uh, to, to greenhouse gas and CO2 emissions. And, and, and some examples are uh, how COVID has uh, disrupted uh, a lot of the big international climate change conferences. Uh, they have been postponed several times and, and so a lot of the important discussions never happened or were delayed. And, and so definitely uh, this, has, this, this has affected the, the, the progress of uh, international climate change uh, negotiations. Um, but, but I think uh, in the last few months, uh, things are beginning to come back to normal. Uh, so hopefully the, uh, the world will get back on track to, to negotiate uh, what they can do in terms of international policies for climate change. Yeah. Thank you, Pavko. Um, yeah, definitely we hope that um, it was just a temporary um, setback and that uh, we now use this, you know, this time that we have at the beginning of this decade, the start of the 2020s, right, to accelerate the transformation. So yet another question that has come in, which is, I find, you know, a very practical, because it's a common question that I, I do hear from friends and, and family members. So there's this, you know, common societal perception is uh, where humans, you know, are separate from and therefore superior to nature, you know. So sometimes, you know, we struggle in our conversations, in our dialogues with the people around us, you know, how do we encourage um, our friends and families, you know, to rethink our relationship with nature? And how can we motivate all generations, you know, people from all walks of life, from all ages, to feel intrinsically motivated to play even a small part towards helping to resolve the climate um, issues that we, have, that we face as, as, a, as a human, as a human being. Uh, yeah, so, so, so uh, again, a very good question, uh, quite, quite a difficult question to answer. Um, I think for many of us uh, attending today's event, uh, we are probably uh, aware that uh, all life is precious, right? And, and how we are already uh, aware that we are interconnected with nature. We depend on nature and nature depends on us. So it's a, it's a very close uh, relationship between nature and, and, and humans. Um, but sometimes uh, we, we forget how, how dependent we are on nature uh, because we, you know, we, we live in a city and then we, we think, oh, it uh, seems like we don't really need nature. We have everything. We turn on the fan. We turn on the aircon. We turn on the lights. Everything is is uh, is, is is engineered. Everything. There's a lot of technology. So it seems like nature is nature is not very important. And nature is just in the park somewhere. We go there when we need to exercise or or, or relax a bit. Um, but in reality, uh, nature is so important right? because um, uh, as I mentioned in my talk, if if we start to Cut down the trees, cut down the forests. Uh, we are, we are destroying the 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 carbon that the nature has helped us uh, lock up for so many years, for hundreds and thousands of years. And once we lose those carbon, the carbon converts into carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, into the, in the atmosphere, and that 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 is the problem that we are creating. We are creating that carbon blanket, and that is what is. Uh, causing climate change and global warming. So, so this, this, these kinds of issues, I think sometimes we, maybe we already know, but we forget, or sometimes, sometimes people may not be aware of those things. So that, that's why it's very important for us to continue to educate people, um, to, to raise awareness, to let them know that you know, this, is, this is why nature is so important to us, and we cannot afford to cut down the trees, um, and, and we cannot afford to, um, to, to lose our biodiversity as well because, because the species, you know, the birds, the butterflies, the monkeys that live in the forest are actually very important component of the forest. They help the forest uh, survive. They help to keep the forest healthy. They help to disperse the, the, tree, the, the seeds or the fruits. They help to pollinate the flowers in the forest and so on. So it's, it's all part of nature. So, so we just need to keep educating and keep reminding ourselves uh, how, how important nature is. Um, and, and, then, and then, of course, when, when, when the, uh, another important way or powerful way to remind ourselves is, is during, um, during, during uh, uh, events where, where we lose part of nature. 
and then uh, for example uh, in, in some parts of the world where the, the mangrove forests are cleared uh, and, and there's nothing to protect the, the coastlines from, from uh, extreme weather events for sea, from sea level rise or from, from, from very extreme uh, stormy weathers uh, then the coastal cities and coastal villages get flooded uh, so, so those those disasters, those those unfortunate events, I think, are also a very powerful reminder to people uh, about how uh, we really cannot afford to destroy nature, and we need to protect as much as we, we can uh, what is remaining. Um, yeah. So, so I hope I hope that answers the, the question. I think it definitely has. Yeah. So, in fact, I think um, this question also um, has given rise to another question, which is more um, action-oriented. Um, this um, person is asking, you know, member of the audience is asking, on an individual level, right, um, how does buying local produce instead of imports help to reduce the impact on climate change? And also, um, how, how, in addition to us, you know, as individuals taking responsibility and making all these small changes, conducting these dialogues and encouraging the families and friends around us, how, how do we also add pressure you know, to the companies, to the corporations, so that these corporations, these companies, you know, can really genuinely um, go green? So two parts to the question here, yeah. Yeah, sure, sure. Happy to answer those. Uh, the local produce, very good question. Uh, thanks for asking that question so I can uh, explain uh, why, why I say that. Um, the, so, so when we, when we import uh, our, our goods, uh, including our food, our, our vegetables, our meats, or whatever, eggs uh, from, from overseas, uh, there is always an environmental cost uh, because the, the food uh, and, and whatever other goods that we import need to travel, could sometimes be traveling very long distances you know, from you know, from, from the Americas, from, from, you know, from Europe, uh, to come to Singapore. And, and uh, the, the mode of transport, whether the, the food is taking a ship or taking an airplane, uh, those modes of transport will be releasing carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases as they carry the, 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 the goods to, to Singapore. So that is a very uh, big, a potentially big carbon uh, footprint. Um, and compare that to local produce, if, if, we, if we are able to produce our own vegetables, our own eggs, and we, we support our own farmers in Singapore, then we immediately we, we don't have to, uh, to import them from overseas, right? so they don't have to travel. The food, the, food, food, uh, the goods don't have to travel. And therefore, we, we can, we can, we can uh, immediately uh, reduce the carbon footprint of our, of, of our foods. Um, and so, so that is a uh, that is why I say uh, if we support our local uh, farmers, our local produce, uh, we can already immediately reduce a lot of uh, carbon emissions, and, and that will help address the climate change uh, problem. Then, um, how do we so so when when in, in some cases, of course, uh, Singapore cannot produce all the food, so we still need to to import our uh, whatever food 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 stuff that we cannot produce ourselves. Uh, so we need to work with big corporations. We need to buy from businesses, international corporations, and so on. Um, one one way to do it to to make sure that the companies or the corporations um, do their best to reduce emissions is to buy from companies or to buy food or products that have some kind of a certification, eco labor, or, or environmentally friendly labor. Um, but having said that, I, I think many of us here also know that uh, sometimes these companies um, uh, uh, or these labeling schemes may not be may not be very reliable. Uh, uh, that there's also the the risk that the companies could be uh, using these labeling schemes to greenwash their 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 businesses. Um, so so it's important to to um, to be very careful about what we buy, uh, not just every product that has a, has a you know, green label or eco label, but be very careful, maybe go online and really read up on what this eco label 
actually means? Uh, does it really require the company to you know, uh, invest and make serious effort to reduce their uh, you know, carbon footprint or protect the, the environment uh, or, or not? Uh, I think in that way, we can make uh, more, more informed decisions, uh, wiser de decisions as consumers, and that can put the pressure on companies to, to really make the effort to reduce their environmental impacts. Uh, but, but it's not easy. Uh, but there are many issues along the way. Um, but I think as consumers, the important point is we have the power to, to force the companies to, uh, to do better. Thank you, Prof. Ko. Um, yes, and we all can, you know, to the point of education, right, this is actually, you know, a, a very good step. If it's your first time to attend a, a talk, a webinar on, on climate change, on sustainability, please keep it up um, and continue to educate ourselves and the people around us. Yeah, so lastly, Prof. Ko, I have um, actually three questions combined into one. Um, yeah, so... There was a question from the audience uh, on the use of data analytics to forecast how soon climate change is going to hit us. So they're wondering, you know, whether this technology can be used to more accurately uh, forecast when this thing will happen, um, which I hope you can also tie in, you know, uh, to a certain extent about what um, like uh, NUS, CNCS is doing what your center is doing, uh, the work that you're doing, and to um, wrap it up, you know, with a final call to action uh, to all of us here in the audience, you know, 900 people, um, so that to motivate us <laughs> to, to, to take action after this call um, and to encourage our friends and families, yeah. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Yari, for, for those uh, last few questions. Um, Data analytics, yeah, sure. Uh, there, there, there's actually a lot of R and D, uh, research and development, de research and development happening, uh, not just in NUS, not just in Singapore, but but globally. Everybody is working very hard to try to understand uh, what the impacts of climate change are. And in Singapore, and in this region, I think Singapore is one one of the uh, that is the Singapore universities and Singapore research institutions are. Uh, a few few of the, the leading ones in this region to, to try to understand how climate change is going to affect us, uh, when, when it's going to affect us. Uh, for example, a lot of effort ha has been going into um, uh, making predictions about uh, the, the, the level of sea level rise. Uh, how, how, how high are we expecting sea level rise, uh, the waters to, to, to be in the next 50 years, 100 years uh, in Singapore? And therefore, that, 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 that will tell us or tell our agencies uh, what they need to do uh, in terms of uh, putting in the, the right infrastructure uh, to, 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 to deal with the sea level rise problem. Uh, but also beyond sea level rise, there's temperature, uh, the heat, the urban heat problem in Singapore. Uh, we are also uh, making a lot of predictions about what the temperature increase will be uh, in the next few decades, and what can we do uh, uh, to, to, to try to reduce that impact. Um, in, in CNCS, uh, Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions, the center that I'm leading in, in Singapore, in NUS, uh, we are focused on how we can use nature to address some of these impacts, as I mentioned in my talk. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, nature is, 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 is um, it's already there, and you know, nature has, has been there for, for many, many uh, millions of years, uh, even maybe uh, before, before us, before humans came, came into existence. Um, and, and so that's a, there's a lot to be learned from, from working with nature. And there's a lot to be learned from nature and also there's a lot to be gained from working with nature in the three ways that I mentioned earlier. You know, protecting the standing forest or the remaining ecosystem so that we don't lose any more of the carbon. We don't contribute any more of uh, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Uh, the, the planet is already warm. It has a very thick blanket. We don't, don't want to add more blanket to the planet. Uh, and then at the same time, we want to grow new forests, plant new more trees, uh, so we can start to, uh, to absorb uh, more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. How we can do that? Uh, where should we be doing that? Uh, not just in Singapore, but also in the region. So those are some of the questions uh, my center is, is focusing on. Um, but, but I think importantly, we are also very keen to, to continue to, 
to uh, communicate what we are doing, to communicate the science of climate change, to communicate the solutions that we are developing and other researchers are developing uh, to a wider audience, uh, including the audience uh, today. I think, I hope uh, that uh, the audience today, all of you, uh, will take what you have learned today and bring it to your families, to your friends, to your social circles, talk to them about climate change, and talk to them about some of the solutions we have been discussing today. Uh, at the same time, also bring them to attend uh, more webinars like this, not just from NUS, but from many other uh, research centers or researchers in Singapore and around the world. Uh, the last thing I would say is uh, also bring them out to nature. Now, there's nothing more important than, than experiencing nature to, to appreciate nature and what nature can do for us. And with that, I, I think uh, I'll stop here. Yes, um, what a yeah, wonderful note to end. Um, Cross Cove, you are sharing that you know nothing beats being out there in the midst of nature to be convinced, you know, that nature needs to be protected, um, needs to be um, nurtured, you know, so that um, needs to be preserved so that the next generation and the generations after that can also um, enjoy the same types of benefits that we do um, presently. Yeah, so thank you once again, uh, Professor Ko, um, and our audience, you know, uh, to our audience as well for this lively and inspirational exchange. Um, I noticed that in the Zoom chat, there's also like a parallel <laughs> um, discussion, you know, giving, you know, feedback, tips and all that on how to be more uh, environmentally friendly. So thank you very much to everyone for your active participation. Um, so next up, we just, uh, we have one, one more culture item by Miss Mi Peishan. She's a SGS Women Division member. Um, Peishan is an educator who started taking classical piano lessons when she was a child. Along the way, she developed other styles of music making through her involvement in various SGS organized projects and in the course of her studies. Mm. Today, she will be playing and singing to the lovely tune of Colors of the Wind. Without further ado, let's welcome Patient Peace. Hi, I'm Patient. Uh, it's good to see everyone here at the talk. And thank you very much for the opportunity to be able to play something over here. Um, uh, I would like to play this song uh, called Colors of the Wind. So as the lyrics uh, has uh, implied that, you know, nature and human beings, they, they are all actually interconnected. So uh, I hope you enjoy this song. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Peishan, you know, for this lovely performance. Let us all give her a virtual round of applause. Yeah. Okay. So there's this part of the song that speaks to me, which I found it especially relevant to our discussion today. It's at the beginning. It goes, you think you own whatever land you land on. The earth is just a dead thing you can claim. But I know every rock and tree and creature has a life, has a spirit, has a name. So as we approach the end of our lecture today, may I invite SGS Women Division Chief, Madam Sek Soon Heng, to deliver the closing address. Madam Sek, please. Okay. Uh, distinguished speaker, Professor Colin Ping, SGS Chairman Director, Mr. Tae Kien, SGS Women Fem uh, members and friends, good afternoon to everyone. First of all, please allow me to express my sincere appreciation to every one of you for taking time off on a beautiful Sunday afternoon to join us for our Soka Women Lecture 2022. And our sincere gratitude to our distinguished speaker, Ms. Professor Ko Lian Bing, who has made time today and missed your very busy schedule to share with us your expertise on the topic, collaborating to solve the climate crisis. Thank you very much. So this is a highly relevant topic in light of the rapid global warming taking place in the world today. And I believe everyone, including myself, have benefited so much from Professor Ko's insightful sharing on how we can collaborate to solve the climate crisis. Thank you very much, Professor Ko. It has been two years since the COVID-19 pandemic has emerged, disrupting the lives of many. Even till today, there are many variants continuing to emerge, causing new ways of infection and creating challenging conditions in many countries. But we are still dealing with the new normal. There are definitely many lessons we can take away from the COVID pandemic. Among these realizations are that our lives are intertwined on a fundamental level. There are pressing issues that we all need to learn to deal with as a community, including the climate crisis affecting our daily lives and the world at large. This January, the New York Times published a report stating that the seven hottest years ever recorded by a clear margin for the past seven. An expert in the report said, the events of 2021 are a stark reminder of the need to change our ways, take decisive and effective steps towards a sustainable society and work towards reducing net carbon emissions. In another report last November by China News Asia, we read that many youth led climate and environmental groups in Singapore have called on the government to boldly accelerate climate action. Their call was, we want to give Singapore a chance for a livable future and put forth a commendable call to actions for Singapore and Singaporeans amongst them of reverence to us in community empowerment. What do these and many other similar reports on climate crisis tell us? On a personal note, I feel it is an important reminder for us to take stock of our daily activities on how we can all take corrective actions to address the global climate crisis. Today, Professor has also shared with us many innovative ways that we can collaborate towards resolving this. In his 40th peace proposal issued by Sokakaka International President, Dr. Daisanko Ikeda annually in January to the United Nations, he again touched on environmental issues as a key area of concern calling for a UN-centered effort to overcome the climate crisis he shared. This year marks seven years since the adoption of the UN of the Sustainable Development Goals with their target year of 2030. Progress towards the realization of the SDGs has been greatly hampered by the pandemic and in order to restart and accelerate that progress, I think it is important to flesh out the core spirit of the SDGs, the determination to leave no one behind, by adding a further vision of building a society where all can savor the joys of being alive. Youth around the world are demanding a greater role in global efforts to address the climate crisis, an issue that directly threatens their lives and futures. 
they are proactively working to establish a framework within which they can consistently participate in discussions and decision-making processes. The SGI has consistently centered youth in our activities to tackle environmental issues. Listening to the voices of young people is not optional. It is the only logical path forward if we are genuinely concerned about the future of our world. Unquote. Indeed, we in SGS, particularly our Soka Women and Young Women Divisions, are spearheading the way towards educating and empowering our women membership on this issue, hoping that we can inspire everyone to protect our Mother Earth. Conducting talks like today, having activities by Soka Kindergarten, the Soka Volunteer Group, and our primary division to educate our young and our members on this subject are among some of our initiatives to do so. Lastly, I would like to end with words from SGI President Dai Sak Dr. Daisaku Ikeda. I quote, In the case of environmental issues, which can be so vast and complex, information and knowledge alone can leave people wondering what this all means to them. And without a clear sense of what concrete steps they can take to counter such feelings of powerlessness and disconnection, education should encourage an understanding of the ways that environmental problems intimately connect to our daily lives. Education must also inspire the faith that each of us has both the power and the responsibility to effect positive change on a global scale. Thank you all once again for spending a meaningful Sunday together with us. My deepest appreciation to our co-organizers, Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions Faculty of Science from the National University of Singapore and the Clean and Green Singapore for your strong support to all our members, friends, for your kind participation today and to the organizing committee for making this lecture a great success. Thank you very much. And please take good care of yourself and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Sek, Women's Division Chief. So we hope that through today's lecture, each of us walks away with a renewed resolve that change is possible and that it begins from within. To help solve one of the greatest challenges of our time, let us once again determine to start with ourselves. And for this to be a truly transformational journey for the planet and humanity, let us continue to encourage the people around us to join us too. We have now come to the end of today's session, but before we end the lecture, shall we turn on our videos if it's convenient so we can take a beautiful photo to commemorate this day? And, you know, let's wear our brightest smiles. And effective steps towards a sustainable society and work towards reducing net carbon emissions. In another report last November by China News Asia, we read that many youth led climate and environmental groups in Singapore have called on the government to boldly accelerate climate action. Their call was, we want to give Singapore a chance for a livable future and put forth a commendable call to actions for Singapore and Singaporeans amongst them of reverence to us in community empowerment. What do these and many other similar reports on climate crisis tell us? On a personal note, I feel it is an important reminder for us to take stock of our daily activities on how we can all take collective actions to address the global climate crisis. Today, Professor has also shared with us many innovative ways that we can collaborate towards resolving this. In his 40th peace proposal issued by Soka Kakai International President, Dr. Daisanko Ikeda annually in January, to the United Nations, he again touched on environmental issues as a key area of concern, calling for a UN-centered effort to overcome the climate crisis he shared. This year marks seven years since the adoption of the UN of the Sustainable Development Goals with their target year of 2030. Progress towards the realization of the SDGs has been greatly hampered by the pandemic and in order to restart and accelerate 
that progress, I think it is important to flesh out the core spirit of the SDGs, the determination to leave no one behind, by adding a further vision of building a society where all can savor the joys of being alive. Youth around the world are demanding a greater role in global efforts to address the climate crisis, an issue that directly threatens their lives and futures. They are proactively working to establish a framework within which they can consistently participate in discussions and decision-making processes. The SGI has consistently centered youth in our activities to tackle environmental issues. Listening to the voices of young people is not optional. It is the only logical path forward if we are genuinely concerned about the future of our world. Unquote. Indeed, we in SGS, particularly our Soka Women and Young Women Divisions, are spearheading the way towards educating and empowering our women membership on this issue, hoping that we can inspire everyone to protect our Mother Earth. Conducting talks like today, having activities by Soka Kindergarten, the Soka Volunteer Group, and our primary division to educate our young and our members on this subject are among some of our initiatives to do so. Lastly, I would like to end with words from SGI President Dai Sak Dr. Daisaku Ikeda. I quote, in the case of environmental issues, which can be so vast and complex, information and knowledge alone can leave people wondering what this all means to them. And without a clear sense of what concrete steps they can take to counter such feelings of powerlessness and disconnection, education should encourage an understanding of the ways that environmental problems intimately connect to our daily lives. Education must also inspire the faith that each of us has both the power and the responsibility to effect positive change on a global scale. Thank you all once again for spending a meaningful Sunday together with us. My deepest appreciation to our co-organizers, Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions Faculty of Science from the National University of Singapore and the Clean and Green Singapore for your strong support to all our members, friends, for your kind participation today and to the organizing committee for making this lecture a great success. Thank you very much. And please take good care of yourself and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Sek, Women's Division Chief. So we hope that through today's lecture, each of us walks away with a renewed resolve that change is possible and that it begins from within. To help solve one of the greatest challenges of our time, let us once again determine to start with ourselves. And for this to be a truly transformational journey for the planet and humanity, let us continue to encourage the people around us to join us too. We have now come to the end of today's session, but before we end the lecture, shall we turn on our videos if it's convenient so we can take a beautiful photo to commemorate this day? And you know, let's wear our brightest smiles.